So hello, everyone. This is my third session time today. So uh, I'll gradually get used to how to run a model and a session now as a moderator. I was very happy to run this one, too. <laughs> OK, so uh, before starting the session, actually, uh, it's a Mateo essential one. Uh, unfortunately, he can't join this session because of his flight is delayed. So we have three panelists here today. And we are discussing about the future of the protocol. So uh, for now, uh, we have a lot of like in a platform software player in the blockchain right now. Uh, and then every people focus on like a building a new protocol, not about you know original protocol, but also like, how we can communicate each protocol together to build the standard in the communication methodology on the blockchain technology right now. And then for you know, discuss this session, we have I know uh, three panelists. So could you guys introduce yourself first? Yeah, my name is Jack Liu. Um, I'm the founder and uh, CEO of uh, Wenchain. Uh, we had a booth outside. I guess everybody have uh, seen it. Uh, we are trying to create a, a protocol between all these uh, new blockchains, and we're trying to create a, a network, a wide area network of blockchains. My name's uh, Matthew Spoke. I'm the founder of the Aeon Project. Um, together with Jack, we actually work on something together called the Blockchain Interoperability Alliance. But the Aeon Protocol is is focusing on. Um, you know, how do you create kind of a routing messaging system to be able to prove that events have taken place on different blockchains uh, very generically uh, rather than specifically to financial assets, but just to any type of data or event that takes place on one of these distributed networks. How can you use the proof of that event to trigger a transaction on another, another network efficiently? So that's kind of the broad strokes of what we're trying to build today on. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Hyde. I live in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I work at Origin Protocol as the head of community. Uh, Origin is building the sharing economy, but in a decentralized way uh, without any intermediaries. Um, we're trying to build like an Airbnb, Uber, et cetera, where there's rating reviews and more of a booking engine um, based on, on blockchain. Uh, we have 38 partners building on our tech and hopefully a lot more, um, but we're, we're doing kind of more of a consumer facing uh, user experience for blockchain. Cool. Cool, great. So uh, let's start from these very basic questions from my side. So I think the blockchain has, right now, it's mainly two directions. One is about the you know, public blockchain, and uh, the other one is permission blockchain. And actually, I use the one for the permission blockchain side. And uh, what do you think about the future of each, and uh, which is more innovative? Yeah. Uh, I'll take that one, uh, uh, because yesterday, actually, um, I gave a speech about how to connect with the uh, public chains as well as uh, permission chains. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as I see it, um, you know, public chains, uh, the data, uh, you know, all the uh, uh, assets are growing very fast. And at the same time, in a, a separate universe, um, uh, all the uh, new enterprise solutions also are building, mm -hmm. right? So they are growing slowly, but we all see that it's very valuable. And um, uh, in the, in the com permission uh, blockchain world, we have many solutions. And uh, one chain also, ha we also have a, a local area network work. We also have our own enterprise solution. But at the same time, we have Hyperledger. Uh, we have uh, uh, e EA Enterprise uh, Ethereum uh, solution for enterprise. And uh, there are many others, right? So uh, for these two, I think all of them will be, uh, I mean, targeting different uh, requirements. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the enterprise world, a lot of times you need to have high performance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, for the uh, tourism or for uh, gaming you, you, or for e-commerce world, mm -hmm. you ha all the transaction TPS has to be very, very high. Right. So, uh, and... At the same time, you cannot, you, you don't want to sacrifice too much of the um, uh, security or decentralization mm, at mm, the same time, mm. right? So what we are trying to do is we build a bridge or build a network of blockchain, uh, including the public, public network or the public blockchains and also the permission mm. uh, private chains at the same time. And uh, uh, using the, the computation power Mm -hmm. from the public chains, uh, strongest, of course, uh, the mm -hmm. Bitcoin or mm -hmm. Ethereum, mm -hmm. and including one chain, <laughs> will supporting all these networks will support each other. 
mm. and uh, reduce the um, you know energy consumption probably for mining okay. and uh, just use the use the very sim simple mechanism as a uh, anchoring uh -huh. uh, as I mentioned yesterday um, you know essentially it's like uh, you you are doing the counting books uh, you're doing this uh, smaller accounting books in a small company. Uh -huh. At the same time, after a, after a certain period of time, yeah. you report the summary back to the bigger ledger, bigger uh -huh. or more powerful ledger. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, for the smaller networks, they support each other and to create this interlocks and uh, will make the whole network stronger. Got it. So which means that you know, in your opinion, the public blockchain and the permission blockchain can be like complementary each other to maintain the entire financial system. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, just to add to what Jack was saying, and we've been, we were involved in this very early on at the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, mm -hmm. focusing on building a private implementation of Ethereum, essentially. Okay. Uh, and there was a number of companies doing that kind of throughout 2015, 2016, and some continuing into 2017. I, I think mm -hmm. two realizations along the way. One, the enterprise market is moving slowly, and mm. probably not as a result of them, but as a result of us not solving their problems fast enough. You right. know, this industry has massive infrastructure challenges that make it impossible uh -huh. to migrate the types of large-scale business processes that Jack was just mentioning a few uh, of onto right. these systems. So right. Right. Um, it's not, you know, it's not, hey, look at these slow-moving giants; they can't adopt new technology. Uh -huh. It's look at this new technology; it can't uh -huh. mature fast enough. You know, uh -huh. and so we have a lot more infrastructure work to do. I mean, the. When we look at this spectrum of private to public, it used to be almost like one versus the other. I think we're realizing now they are definitely more complementary, and they almost live on a spectrum of certainty. They live on, you know, if you want perfect certainty, you go to a very, very decentralized public network, and it gives you, you know, near perfect certainty. If you're comfortable with your, your, your counterparts on a network, and you're okay with, you know, less than perfect certainty because there's a layer of established trust already, right. then you're on the other end of the spectrum. And, right. uh, you know, layered on top of that is the fact that, and I think this was a little bit of, it's still a little bit of a miss that we're seeing some enterprises kind of shift out of is mm. the fact that you can't just look at blockchains as being interesting technical innovations. They are significantly more than that, and, and, and notably, they're economic innovations. They're mm -hmm, innovations mm -hmm. that allow you to incentivize behavior towards a common outcome, right? Towards mm -hmm. a, a desired outcome on a network. Mm -hmm. um, so stripping away the economic layer of these networks, mm -hmm. which is what used to be the conversation around private blockchains, right. is not good enough on its own. You know, mm -hmm. it can exist as a scaling solution. It can exist as a way to achieve performances and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, apply certain rules and restrictions in a network, mm -hmm. but on its own, it, it misses a significant part of the value of these systems, mm -hmm. which is economically incentivizing a crowd-powered network rather than mm -hmm. centralized institutions just kind of having to pay you know significant amounts of money to manage infrastructure the way they have historically. I see. Um, I, see. Yeah. I think I have kind of additional question on that, uh, yeah, for Matt. So, you know, in my understanding, the, the critical difference between public blockchain and permission blockchain, the whether or that blockchain has proof of X or not. So from that perspective, I'm kind of curious about, you know, do you think it's possible to apply some idea of the proof of X, which is like an economic incentive model into the permission blockchain world? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that we have to still figure out, there's still some, some people that, that strongly hold the belief that all enterprise applications and processes will eventually migrate onto public networks. And, uh -huh. you know, yet to be seen if that's true or not. Uh. Um, so what you could imagine is you could imagine that on top of public networks, you could have second layer protocols that allow you to kind of stake into a permissioned ecosystem that sits on top of a public right. network. Right. So it, it doesn't need to be that they're mutually exclusive from each other. So uh -huh. you can say, well, you know, with a particular stake or restriction on top of a public network, I'm only going to allow a particular list of white labeled addresses to participate uh -huh. in this uh -huh. ecosystem, uh -huh. for uh -huh. example. Uh -huh. So you, they might be separated from each other and then leverage some sort of interoperability solution uh -huh. along the lines of what we're building or what Wanshian's building, uh, or they might be second layer protocols uh -huh. on top of public networks. Uh -huh. um, there is a, you do need a mechanism to allow for a group of counterparties uh -huh. to, um, a group of counterparties to agree. So all of these systems come down to consensus. Uh -huh. There are uh, consensus functions that are best used for a group of people who don't know each other. Uh -huh. And there are other consensus functions that are best used for a group of people who do know each other. And right. they just need a right. kind of simple way to vote and agree on a regular basis. Uh -huh. uh, so that's, you know, it's, it's at that layer that you see most of the differences between, 
you know, private and public networks. Right, interesting. So which means that probably we can see some kind of, you know, customer use cases by using like, you know, uh, at the Plasma Cache or Lightning Network in the specific use case in permission, permission blockchain world. That's very interesting, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. And let me add on something that I didn't see covered by those two answers, which is in the industry, I think we wanna just keep on saying blockchain and supporting the technology without realizing that a lot of the private blockchains that I'm seeing are just SQL databases, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And there's no need to kind of use that that added layer without just realizing you want to pick the best technology to meet the needs of your users. And uh -huh. in many cases, that's not going to be blockchain. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. Very true. I agree with that. Right. Okay. Let's move to the uh, next question stuff. So uh, this is actually related to the proof of work stuff. So. I think everyone wants to know. So Ethereum, you know, moving to the proof of stake, you know, Casper is based on the proof of stake and from the uh, proof of work. So it's a very, very fundamental question. What's trade off between proof of stake and proof of work? Who wants to first? <laughs> I mean, let me start one layer up. I think what's, okay. what's, um, what's really encouraging at this stage of the industry is that we can run parallel global experiments with the capital to support them, right? So right, right. that means people have hypotheses on technical design and on economic motivations for how people will interact in a system. And we have the flexibility to design all sorts of parallel systems that mm -hmm. prove or disprove these hypotheses. Mm -hmm. uh, so all the criticisms around Ethereum Classic back mm -hmm. in 2016 launching or forking off of the Ethereum network, mm -hmm. I actually think it's turned out to be a really great opportunity to experiment two different economic models side by side. Mm -hmm. All else being relatively equal, we can test the behavior of users mm -hmm. in one economic design and mm -hmm. the behavior of users in another economic design. Mm -hmm. The reality is that with all the research and theorizing that we can do ahead of launching a system, mm -hmm. we only really learn its implications after launching the system, right? right? And, and then we have to figure out how to adjust from there if we, if we guessed wrong, if right. we had the wrong hypothesis. Um, the big criticism in the proof of work world today, obviously, is computing power. Yeah. The, the heavy cost of computing power to run networks like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some legitimacy to that claim, but I also think that we miss out on why there's an expensive cost of computing to run the Bitcoin network. Mm -hmm. There's intended to be a very, very expensive barrier to entry to take over this network and damage it, right? So... Um, and what never gets brought up in the conversation about criticizing the cost of mining in Bitcoin mm. is we don't have the statistics to be able to point to the cost of electricity powering the global visa network or mm -hmm. the powering right. global banking infrastructure. You can probably bet that it's equivalent and or larger than the mm -hmm. cost of operating mm -hmm. the Bitcoin mm -hmm. network. So I don't see it necessarily as a net negative. Mm -hmm. I think there are interesting trends that should, got, should get brought up in the industry Cost of electricity in many cases is on a curve potentially to near zero mm -hmm. with new types of renewable energies mm -hmm. being tested. What does that do to the economics of the Bitcoin network if mm -hmm. electricity is not a constraint? Mm -hmm. Then is it still as secure as it was designed to be? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a reason that we should be challenging the status quo of mm -hmm. proof of work. Right. But I don't think that it's simple enough to say, well, it's expensive mm -hmm. and consuming of energy, therefore it's bad. Because I think right. part of its security comes from the fact that it's expensive right. and consuming of energy. Yeah. Proof of stake, one of its criticisms in different implementations it applies differently, is um, essentially allowing participants with significant financial assets to dictate the direction of the network in some mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. if they're bad actors. Right. Um, one of the risks in the proof of work network around essentially there being nothing at stake if you're dishonest. You don't mm -hmm. lose anything if you're dishonest mm -hmm. if, is one of the things they're trying to solve for in proof of stake. Mm -hmm. So that there is not only an incentive for being honest, but also a disincentive for being dishonest. Mm -hmm. And that I think is an interesting twist to the economic design of these systems. But again, I think we'll have to see a live implementation of Casper before we know, you know perfectly well what the outcome right. is. That's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have been watching very closely about um, you know Casper uh, yep. progress, mm. and uh, uh, OneChain, our team uh, is trying to implement uh, POS at the same time, right? And uh, we understand that uh, this is a very challenging issue. Mm. Right? Uh, many teams have um, have tried uh, right uh, with a simpler mechanism uh, mm -hmm. in, in the past, but. Um, um, POS itself uh, is 
quite complicated because e economic or incentive mechanism, how to make the network secure, uh -huh. right? Stake meaning really uh, in today's world or, or Casper's world, really it's $1, one vote uh -huh. right? in, in, a, in a traditional sense, right? Uh -huh. And we want to design a system that there's some kind of a check and balances and, and, and really uh, make it decentralized uh, at the same time, make the network secure. Uh -huh. And we all know uh, POW has been out there, right, since uh, Bitcoin and has been tested. And uh, uh, Ethereum uh, used the same mechanism for uh, for past few years. Uh -huh. And uh, it's simple and uh, uh, it, it works, right? Okay. So, uh, but we are moving, as Matthew pointed out, we, you know, the whole community uh, thinks that we need to, you know, figure out a new way, right? uh -huh. new consensus mechanism. And uh, POS has been out there for many years as, as uh -huh. well, uh -huh. right? We just have to figure out what is the right mechanism, uh, uh -huh. security deposit, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, there's, there's a collusion, collusion uh, problem as well, uh -huh. right? And, uh, uh, and th there are many uh, complicated issues out there. So, um, but we, we f think that stake, uh, same time, could be, and more than just dollars, uh -huh. right? Uh, we, we're trying to figure out, incorporate more things. Mm -hmm. uh, as a stake owner of this network, mm -hmm. you want to maintain the security, mm -hmm. and we're trying to incorporate more than just the security deposit. Yeah. Got it. You go first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, just to add to Jack's point uh -huh. quickly, I mean, the, I think one of the challenges is realizing that the limitation to some is not the limitation to everyone. So okay. let, if, you're, if you're massively wealthy, mm and proof of stake is the only security mechanism, uh, then it might not be, it might not have money. the same impact on you, right? Uh -huh. Because you're, you might be willing to spend the money to break a system. Uh -huh. um, so we need to think about what are the motivations of different types of participants of these networks. So the way we, we've thought about it is our, our intended final consensus algorithm relies uh -huh. on three different types of, call them asset classes. And uh -huh. it's not really asset, but it, it, it essentially comes down to what am I willing to put at risk and what am I willing to lose? Uh -huh. So in some cases, money might be the right motivator. Uh -huh. In other cases, it's computing power, which right. I guess uh -huh. can kind of translate to money because uh -huh. there's uh -huh. a cost of operating uh -huh. computing power. And the third aspect that we're really interested in is reputation. Uh -huh. uh, for some, money will not be the issue, but reputation will be more important. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So you're starting to hear of networks today like proof of authority networks, uh -huh. where the entire security of the network relies on the reputation of those supporting uh -huh. the network, uh -huh. right? So uh -huh. their willingness to break the system has to come with willingness to kill their reputation. Uh -huh. And I think if we find the right balance between reputation, money, and compute, uh -huh. we could find a really nice equilibrium to make sure that regardless of who the participant is, what motivates them, uh -huh. we still find a way to economically incentivize them, uh -huh. but also make sure that they have a disincentive financial or otherwise uh -huh. to not act badly in one of these right, networks. Right. I think, you know, uh, yeah, I would like to ask an additional question on that. Because, you know, I think you know, the timing of the Ethereum is moving to the proof of stake. It's one of the key issues we have to think about it. The reason, you know, if the Ethereum take the proof of stake from their initial start, do you think it would be successful? Because, you know, which means that the most very, very small community of Ethereum, like Bitrix and as a founder, and also any other, like, you know, ICO investor only hold the, you know, Ethereum token as a proof of stake. Kind of, like, as you said, like it's dominant player in the Ethereum community. So, but now Ethereum is like you know most of the Ethereum tokens is distributed to like you know, I don't know it's uh, 50 thousand smart contracts, and also they built you know a lot of like corner stuff. Any other like you know ecosystem player is coming up, and then now their market cap is uh, 40 billion dollars or so. So it's quite difficult to dominate the Ethereum you know entire ecosystem. What do you think about this point? Anyone? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe a little bit of, uh, of, of, let's just look at the industry. I mean, I saw a yeah. joke earlier today, which uh -huh. was, you know, I'd rather have 20,000 Bitcoin and $80 transaction fees than what we have right now. Uh -huh. You know, we, we have it pretty good right now, right? Uh -huh. And I think that if I were to take a critical look at the community around uh -huh. the entire tech ecosystem, everybody pretty much wants it to be better and is financially incentivized to uh -huh. work together on this. Right. Whether you know, if we're working together <coughs> cross-chain or just on our own projects. If you're trying to get, you know, we, we all rise together. And I think the, the blockchain community as a whole still has that magic. Uh -huh. We're still on the same team. Uh -huh. Everybody in this room, we're uh -huh. still on the same team. Right. And there's very few coins out there that are actually trying to make sure that they're the best and everybody else is not. Uh -huh. 
So, you know, in a year, are we going to be having the same exact conversation? Are we going to be talking about how Casper knocked out of the park and we're all using that now? Or oh. Lightning Network had a flaw? Or uh -huh. maybe. Right. But, but hopefully, we're going to see that, that trend and we can be absolutely collaborative uh -huh. in that success. And I think that's a really important thing to kind of take a step back and realize that, yeah, there's going to be missteps. We're, we are going to see one of these solutions that should have fixed everything not. Uh -huh. And we need to be okay with that and then support those that are, are trying to make that. I see. Right. Uh -huh. So let's move to the uh, next question. So, yeah, it's actually kind of related to the interoperability issue. So, what do you think about the future of proof of X? You know, any kind of new interesting or you know practical idea about you know new proof of X something? This is actually I found a news article about the proof of activity. It's kind of hybrid model between proof of work and proof of stake. Any other new information? You guys have it right now? <laughs> anyway. I, I think there's, again, all of these things are, what I find really funny about this is, we, we were talking about this yesterday, cryptographers must be like out of their minds happy because for the first time in the world, everybody wants to be a cryptographer. Everybody <laughs> wants to solve <laughs> cryptographic problems. Uh, this used to be an industry that did not get much attention. Now the superstars of our industry are the academics that used to hide in you know, university labs. Uh -huh. uh, so everybody's trying to solve interesting problems with cryptography. Uh -huh. um, and I think there's cool experiments that may come out of this. I mean, uh -huh. you know, jokes aside, we're working on a proof of X. We're okay. working on a proof of intelligence in uh -huh. our protocol. Uh -huh. um, uh, not personal intelligence. Uh -huh. Jack wins every time on that one. Uh -huh. um, but uh, computing intelligence. And, and I think there's kind of merit to say uh -huh. that there might be better ways of optimizing for uh, in different systems, making sure that you know the use of resources that we are putting into these systems might have uh, the uh, the opportunity to have secondary benefit. Uh -huh. So instead of you know in some uh, proof of work systems, another criticism that often comes up is that uh -huh. it's generally brute force computing uh, with you know an output that is throwaway, right? It's uh -huh. not it doesn't have kind of an external or externality in terms of a benefit. So could yeah. you potentially require compute that is also useful for something, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. and this is where we're kind of taking some of our research. Mm. Um, but I, I don't see this as a negative thing, Proof of X. I think okay. you know, we're constantly going to see new uh, evolutions of these, of these systems. Uh -huh. What's different in this industry versus the last, and the last, I mean, you know, the evolution of the internet to uh -huh. consumer applications, uh -huh. um, is at some point we stopped developing the protocol and we started developing the, the market on top of the protocol, right? Okay. So we, we had a point in time where TCP IP became a mm. standard, and then we developed <laughs> layers above TCP IP, and mm. those became the standard, and then we all built businesses on those standards. I suspect in our industry, the standard will be a moving target. I suspect uh -huh. it will adjust and evolve constantly. Right. And we may find better ways and more efficient ways, and mm. you know, s s like the, the point I made earlier about if electricity goes to zero dollars, then right. maybe we have to reevaluate the security of the Bitcoin system with a new method, That's right? right? That's so right. that evolution, I think, is healthy. It just means that it's very difficult. Uh -huh. If you're trying to build a business and pick where to build it, uh -huh. it's probably a pretty challenging like landscape to look across, right? Because you don't know where the end solution is going to work or not work or be uh -huh. adopted or uh -huh. not be adopted. Uh -huh. um, but generally, I think the state that we're at today, we're in the research stage of this industry. Uh -huh. So the more ideas that get thrown around and tested, the better. Uh, I see. So, oh yeah, go ahead first. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree uh, with Matthew. Mm. I think right now uh, the industry is experimenting with different ideas. Mm. Right? Mm. Sometimes they look at it proof of this and proof of that. It can feel <laughs> funny, you know, sometimes. <laughs> but uh, I think it's very important uh, a step for the industry to look at things uh -huh. and to try it out yeah but um, for us uh, we are still sticking to you know oh. a proof of stake but we're trying to uh, you know expand that stake what that it is right uh -huh. a stake owner you probably not just make just money I mean, uh -huh. not just the, your own coin it could oh. be something else oh. and that's why we're trying to figure it out and uh, trying to implement uh, in the near future Right, interesting. So, yeah, I'd like to ask you the kind of additional question on this. So, a lot of like a new proof of X idea is coming up in, in, in even in the long term too. So, from the you know cross chain transaction perspective, interoperability perspective, do you guys you know any other you know new findings or new technical or the business challenge? How you know to me like you know there is some kind of technical issue there that you know interoperability between you know blockchain, but based on a different in proof of X model should have some kind of problem in the transaction model. What do you think about this? Yeah, I, I, th I think the, the point of cross-chain protocols mm -hmm. is, is a realization that there is differences. You know, I call them languages in analogy. You know, blockchain number one 
is built a certain way. It has a, a certain mechanism of consensus. It's got a certain execution structure for transactions. And it's very different than blockchain number two that has a different consensus mechanism and a different mm -hmm. execution structure for transactions. Mm -hmm. So the cross-chain's function is to act almost as the interpreter. You know, uh, how can uh, I understand language A hi, hi, and hi, transmit hi. it in such a uh, way that is understandable uh, to blockchain B? Yeah. Um, that's, you know, kind of the point and why these, these protocols are so relevant. Right. And this is not too different from, again, simple analogy, but, you know, mm. you think about Apple as an operating system for uh, its computers right. and PCs and the operating systems that, the, that evolved around you know, MS-DOS and, uh -huh. and Windows and, you know, the operating system we use in the PC world, uh -huh. these are di different computing systems. Right. You know, inherently, no reason for them to be able to understand messages that leave one and arrive in the other other than the fact that they agreed on the in-between and the uh -huh. in-between became TCP IP, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So that if I was sending a message off of an Apple and it needed to be received on a PC, mm. different operating systems right. on each computer, uh -huh. that operating system still needed to be able to interpret that message, even if it came from a different kind of, you know, root. Uh -huh. um, and it's a little, it's more complex here because uh -huh. these are much more complex computing systems. Uh -huh. But fundamentally, I think it's the same thing. And that's what, you know, we're trying to establish. And, you know, even the work that we're doing alongside WANChain and ICON at the Blockchain Interoperability Alliance is less so about standardization. It's more so about just testing different ideas in parallel, oh. seeing which one works, uh -huh. and then we can all learn from each other's experiments and, and then adjust to get to the right answer. Because uh -huh. we don't know the right answer yet, uh -huh. right? So there's going to be different ways of kind of testing for that interpretation layer between blockchains. Interesting. Yeah. So for the, yeah, I want to have a question to Andrew. Yeah. So yeah. Origin Protocol, we have, we're trying to go up against, mil, you know, billion dollar monopolies with open source software. Uh -huh. And I think a lot of us are doing this. And uh -huh. I, I think it doesn't matter who gets it right to the end user. The end user just wants it to work for them. And so I'm glad we're having these conversations here, but these are not conversations that are gonna be able to be repeatable uh -huh. by our, our users. Uh -huh. So at some point we need to obsess over them and at some point we need to think about how those are perceived by the public. Uh -huh. And if we're gonna fight about them and that's the public perception, that's uh -huh. gonna do us a grand disservice in the long run. Yeah, that's great. And also, yeah, I have a question to you because, like, you know, as a, you're from your experience as the founder of the Startup Weekend, it's totally, you know, decent as fashion, like, you know, startup in event stuff. So, you know, what kind of elements will be the key for us to, like, you know, help each other or, you know, learning each other about you know, developing those kind of protocol layer? So in 2004, I got a bunch of people like this in, in a room together, and instead of talking about what we do, I challenged everybody to start a company uh -huh. together. So let's get strangers together and try to start companies. Uh -huh. And that opened up, and we, we created a nonprofit, and we ran it as a global events company, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, where we really didn't try to dictate what people did, but it got to 160 countries. Uh -huh. It turns out entrepreneurship is truly the global language. Right. Right. Everybody, it worked everywhere. It worked in Bhutan, right. it worked right. in Kuwait, it worked everywhere. We were in every active war zone at one point. Uh -huh. So entrepreneurship speaks. Uh -huh. People want to create. People want to actually be in right. charge of their right. own future and their own destiny. Right. So you've got to open it up. And, and, and looking back, you know, uh -huh. I was trying to, to figure out and actually put words to what everything blockchain is now as far uh -huh. as decentralization, as far as finding, finding a way to tr trust uh -huh. everybody around uh -huh. the world. Uh -huh. um, you know, slow database that everybody, everybody can trust uh -huh. is truly the goal, you know, in, in for for currencies and for a lot of the protocols that we're building. Um, so it's, it's amazing to see it come to light, and it's amazing uh -huh. that all, a lot of smarter people than me are actually uh -huh. um, doing, doing some amazing things with it. Right. But at, you know, 10 years ago, we were just trying to prove this, this concept that mm. people could mm. create together. Yeah. And now we've got this tech stack where it's truly global, it's truly unstoppable, oh, it's truly right. you know, collaborative. Right. The worst thing right. we can do is, is disagree to the point where we need to try to take each other down. Right, that's very interesting. Right, we yeah. need to look at the problems authentically uh -huh. and, then, and then build out solutions that uh -huh. really takes into consideration uh -huh. Uh -huh. some really strong big players with uh -huh. a lot of money and uh -huh. the first person that's, that's heard about it is having uh -huh. that first magical experience. Right. But my goal, my, I hope that a year from now we're not talking about these protocol layers uh -huh. like we are right now. I hope uh -huh. we're saying, well, I have a user and their life is better because of right. this. Yeah, that's the ultimate goal we are focusing right now. That's true. You want to go? Uh, yeah. Let me add to that. Yeah. Um, for the um, Blockchain Interoperability Alliance, we're trying to figure out the, the standards, really. But th that's a long way to go, right? Uh, I think we're trying to create something like HTTP for the World Wide Web. Uh -huh. But uh, it's, not, it's a lot more complicated, uh -huh. right? 
um, because on the blockchain, uh, n you, you are moving the information from one chain to another, but uh -huh. it's really we are trying to solve the double spending problem. Uh -huh. On one chain, on one blockchain, uh, it's a lot easier. Right? Uh -huh. Everybody in the network, you, you can prevent the double spending. But yeah. when you have cross-chain, you have to lock it, lock it up the asset in one chain uh -huh. and you spend it on the other, right? Uh -huh. and vice versa. So the protocol itself will be a lot more complicated than the HTTP itself. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, we, are, we are looking at it. We have many different ideas. We're mm -hmm. trying to uh, come up with proposals. We're also open to the whole uh, community yeah. mm -hmm. right, to come up with proposals. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are working with um, associations mm -hmm. uh, and also with the government. Uh, recently, uh, there's ISO uh, standards. They're trying to right. standardize the yeah. uh, blockchain uh, basic technologies, including the uh, interoperability uh, mm -hmm. protocols. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are trying to work with the, all these uh, agencies um, and uh, come up with uh, I mean roadmaps mm -hmm. for, for us. So in the beginning, all, all, uh, all the uh, parties in the alliance will try to uh, create our own little networks first, and then we'll uh, connect mm -hmm. with each other, mm -hmm. and then we'll expand this network uh, little by little. Yeah. Right. I think I totally agree with you because one of the key difference compared to the internet is like, you know, those kind of protocol development kind of histor historical things that happening in the blockchain is totally different from the internet because, you know, internet protocol layer usually you know, designing it led by like academic organization stuff. But now in a blockchain, because we can use the ICO, so a lot of like, you know, market economy player, private player, you know, does an experiments by themselves and they try to, you know, sometimes it's competing with each other, but sometimes, you know, learning each other to develop like, you know, what is the most like, you know, practical fit for the, you know, standardization protocol, but also the interoperability with each protocol. That's, I think it's completely new trend, what's happening, going, you know, happening right now in this industry. Yeah, to agree with you. Very interesting. It too. So I have finished my whole three questions. So from now, I'm open to the question to the audience. <laughs> so does anyone? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hi hey everyone, uh, interesting uh, discussion. Um, so um, I know that you know protocols are really important, but like from the business perspective, how do how does a you know protocol project make profit? So I, I can take that. So at Origin Protocol, I mean we're we're dealing with sharing economy. Uh, mm -hmm. One of our founders had the the great pleasure to have a, an Uber ride with the thirtieth driver for Uber, mm -hmm. and after over seven years, guess what he's doing? He's still driving for Uber. And he's not happy about that. Mm -hmm. So as a protocol, we're paying in coin, and they can choose to hold that. And hopefully you know, they become an investor by, by doing that. Um, I think there's a lot of, of services you can build out as well. So you can offer the protocol and then offer the ability to build on that protocol, similar to like Pivotal Labs mm -hmm. um, out of the States. Um, there's quite a few business models. Right. Yeah. yeah um I th so for, for us, I'll, I, I think the model for us is, is we're treating this as essentially like an ongoing research and development activity to constantly evolve the protocols that we're developing. Mm. Um, to fund that is essentially to tie ourselves to whether people believe in what we're building. And if they believe in what we're building, then the, the value of our ecosystem will increase and the value of the assets that we hold will increase. And if they don't believe in what we're doing, then the value will decrease and we'll run out of funding because nobody believes in what we're doing. And that's probably the right conclusion if nobody believes in what we're doing. So I think there's like a nice synergy here between tying your, you know, your future promise to whether the community is supporting you. And that's reflected essentially in the price of your ecosystem, right? So if the community is supporting you, then the value of your assets is, is, is greater over time and you can continue to fund yourself on the value of those assets. Doesn't mean we don't have to be smart and you know, financially manage these assets effectively. We're still dealing in a very volatile market where some things happen irrationally. Um, but over time, I think the rational trend will be that with enough support, the value of your asset will grow and you can continue to fund yourself off the value of that asset. Beyond that, if it ever came to a point where this was necessary, I mean, there are lots of examples of nonprofit foundations mm. in other industries that have funded themselves off of contributions and donations from people who end up using these protocols. Linux is a perfect example of that right. that is funded by 
you know, the collective of companies that, that build businesses on top of Linux. And I think there's a, there's a funding mechanism in there as well. In fact, that's kind of how we're building the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. The Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is built off the contributions of its members. Mm -hmm. uh, so about 400 members, all of whom pay annual fees to fund the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance activities. Uh, so there, there's a spectrum. Um, but I, I do think, you know, one point that I've been bringing up more and more is that I think it's important that we realize that there are protocols that will operate within business models and there are protocols that need to be detached from business models <laughs> and that the governance structure around these non-profit protocols needs to be very well thought through. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, particularly ICO investors need to start asking these questions a little bit more before they start putting money in because oh. one of the challenges I see in the future is conflicts arising between capital tables, meaning like shareholders mm -hmm. of companies and coin holders of protocols if there happens to be a disagreement of priorities or you know, a decision that needs to be made that is beneficial to one but disadvantages the other. Uh, that's the types of governing questions that we're so early in the industry, we haven't come across that yet. But I, I kind of envision that we'll probably start running into challenges where if you have these two different groups of stakeholders, you may be cause chat like conflicts down the road. Mm -hmm. But not in all cases. But I think there's some protocols where it's appropriate to make sure that you clean up that, that kind of accountability structure. Right. No. Let me build on that. I've, I've worked in startups for 15 years. And usually the, the, you build a startup, you get some success, you try to raise venture capital, you go through the painful process of raising venture capital, mm -hmm. and then hopefully if you've done everything right, you have an exit and the founder sees some money. Right? And then the company is in control of people that don't necessarily have the user in mind and right. don't, really have, don't really care about the future of the, the product. They, mm -hmm. they might have bought it to kill it off or something. Mm -hmm. So with the ICO, with this market, we've flipped that. Mm -hmm. We've kind of put that, that acquisition on day one, and we've put the founder in control and the community the first thing in mind. Yeah. And so there's a lot of positives and negatives to this. Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing a lot of the ICO madness and kind of frauds come up, and that's the biggest negative. But we don't, we don't get this opportunity often. Mm -hmm. So hopefully everybody in this room knows that and mm -hmm. sees that this is not, this is rare. We see this once every 10 years that we have this opportunity to build and build amazing software for, to delight people. Mm -hmm. I hope yeah, we don't screw it up. Yeah, but thinking about the sustainability of the one product, one software, that approach is actually you know, more practical. Pra practical. That's what I'm thinking sometimes, yeah. True. Good. Yeah, just use the Linux uh, as an example, you know, mm -hmm. you have the you know, basic foundation, uh -huh. uh, you shouldn't use it as a, you know, profit-making uh -huh. um, mechanism, just uh -huh. like the foundation for each uh, protocol we are doing today. Um, if you want to make money, you probably have to build separate app uh, companies, for-profit companies, uh, build applications, serve to the customers, and get, get a profit there, right? right? And for the in interoperability, um, you know, protocols, right, um, I'm guessing that, we don't have tokens for that, right? So um, uh, I guess the community will give you a lot of honor and, uh, and possibly some donations, right? Uh -huh. uh, in the early days, um, you know, whoever invented uh, HTTP or World War Y, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, right? right? Uh, he got honor, right? Turing yeah. Award. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll probably create Turing Award in the uh, blockchain industry. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> yeah. That's correct. <laughs> I don't agree with you. Okay, uh, next question. I think there. Are you? I know. Uh, any other question? Who? Are you? Yeah, I know. Uh, we have five more minutes. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll riff on something. Really okay. Good. I'm going to challenge everybody to realize, like. My question I want to ask or just point out is that this, is, this room is pretty packed. Every uh -huh. go to these conferences all around the world uh -huh. when we do that. Uh -huh. If ETH and Bitcoin price drops to $20 each, uh -huh. are we still going to be in this room? Uh -huh. Are we still excited about the technology? Are uh -huh. we still excited about the community? Uh -huh. And if your answer is no to that, are you trying to lead the discussion? Right. right. And I see a lot of people, like, the technology is just so amazing. We have such a big opportunity. Uh -huh. We don't care about the price. We want to build right. the best right. tech. And then there's a lot of people that are really excited that Bitcoin is, is you know, they're super rich now, uh -huh. and they're just playing off of that. Right. So let's, let's examine who we, who we take advice from, and let's uh -huh. examine 
why why we're in the game, uh -huh. if you will. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really interesting discussion for this panel, but also just in the hallways of this conference. It's just right. let's look at why we love this technology and what right. this will do to the right. world and what this will do to have cross borders. Mm -hmm. and but, yeah, and I, I think you know maybe to add on that the the. I think what's, what's been missing in a lot of conversations is that the coins follow the protocol and not the other way around. Mm. Meaning, you know, today we have somewhat of an artificial market that's been created around excitement and speculation and, and, and people finding out about this for the first time. Mm -hmm. But it has not come with the adoption to support that, these prices, right? right. So um, you have to understand, I think that these protocols, first and foremost, are mechanisms to build decentralized operating systems to redesign businesses and, mm. and societies, essentially. Yeah. Um, and the coins are the mechanisms to incentivize the right behaviors in those systems, right? So, uh, so that means securing these systems and acting honestly with your counterparts and all of these things, the coin plays the role of security. Yeah. But if we're using the coin without using the operating system, mm -hmm. then the only logical conclusion is that the coin is worthless at the end of the day. Yeah, totally. So, um, and that, it, might, it might take time to become worthless mm -hmm. because there's a lot of excitement and a lot of speculation, yeah. et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. But keep that in mind. I mean, this is the biggest frustration of most people in the Ethereum community is that the excitement around the coins picked up so quickly before the adoption around the technology picked uh -huh. up. Uh -huh. And probably 99% of the transactions happening on Ether are speculative transactions, uh -huh. not operating system transactions, uh -huh. meaning not running applications uh -huh. and smart contracts, but uh -huh. just trading and speculating and et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. Until we get to the flip of that, where 99% is using the operating system uh -huh. and 1% happens to be market speculators, uh -huh. that's a healthy ecosystem, right? Uh -huh. So we need to make sure that the biggest thing we should be pushing for yeah. is adoption of the technology. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's some markets in the world, uh -huh. and I hate to say this in Japan, but Japan is one of them, <laughs> where the excitement around the coin precedes the excitement around the technology. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to make sure that we're emphasizing right. the right things. Right. Um, so, so you know, my perspective. But. Yeah, that's really true. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Uh, I experienced a big market meltdown in 2013, right? 90% drop, 90% drop, right? I think a lot of, I, I heard a 70% uh, large percentage of the uh, users, or we call it speculators, mm -hmm. left the market. At that time, right, and only the true believers and uh, maybe the Crisis. the developers yeah. <laughs> stay, good. stay, right, and uh, we all benefit a lot uh, from that, mm. right. Um, I think mar market goes up and down, right. Uh -huh. But at the same time, Matthew pointed out, uh, for some coins, uh, they will go to zero. I mean, uh -huh. not only fifty dollars, but they'll go to zero, right, uh -huh. uh, for many different reasons. Um, just uh, I, I think probably uh, a lot of projects will, will be and en end up like that, yeah. Uh -huh. So I think uh, for the regular investors or for the community, we want to focus on, uh, you know, technology. We want to focus on the real applications instead of, uh, you know, yeah. uh, scams and uh, just right. the, uh, right. uh, we call it error, error coins, uh -huh. right? Uh, <coughs> currently, just too much, um, too much uh, speculations. I think it requires uh, government regulations. Uh -huh. uh, it's kind of a you know, uh, result of uh, self-regulation didn't work. Uh -huh. right? uh -huh. So the community tried to self-regulate it, but it did not work uh -huh. right, in the 2017. So the, all the government agencies c came out, issued very tough uh -huh. regulations on us. Uh -huh. So right now, we just have to figure it out, right? The whole community with the media, with uh, associations, we will figure out how to uh, make this uh, industry uh, grow healthily. Yeah, totally true. I think, you know, thinking about the Japanese kind of characteristics of the Japanese market and, and most of like, you know, my investor or business people or like entrepreneur prefer or tend to focus on like a business perspective of the blockchain. Like, you know, what's, you know, how are we going to make money through the blockchain or something? But I think it's, this approach is totally wrong. You know, as you said, you know, as you guys said, like, you know, we never, we should not never forget the social context of this technology. So what kind of a social exchange or social transmission we have through the blockchain is the most important item that we have to keep in its mind. Because that's the most of the things that we have to keep in its mind to tell other people how this software is so innovative. Yeah, so I think, you know, I really, really, you know, Pray that and prefer that the Japanese, you know, set of people should discuss about this topic all the time. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's a good time to uh, finish this session now. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.